You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's up? Hope you're all well out there and welcome along to a brand new Straight to Video Podcast. Today's show, I get to welcome a bona fide legend in the form of Slim Jim Phantom. Jim is best known as the drummer for the mighty rockabilly band The Stray Cats, who took classic 50s star jams and fused them with their youthful angst and modern rock and roll style to create a sound and vibe like no other. Jim has carried that spirit throughout his career and continues to perform with the Slim Jim Phantom Trio all over the world, which also features his wife Jenny V on bass, who is also a member of the Eagles of Death Metal, so they are a true rock and roll couple. Now, I only got a short time to chat to Jim as he's a busy dude, but we managed to cover a lot of fun stuff in this conversation. We hear all about the Stray Cats' first trip over to the UK in the early 80s, which actually almost didn't happen. Now, imagine if that had been the case, and history could have been very different indeed. I get to ask and learn all about Jim's infamous Cat Club, which he opened on Hollywood's Sunset Strip, where many of my all-time favourite musicians and influencers would regularly jam. And we also talk about Slim Jim's latest collaborative project, following on from Head Cat with Lemmy, Dead Men Walking with Captain Sensible and the Alarms Mike Peters, we can now get set for The Barnstormers, who will soon be releasing their self-titled debut album on May 26th, and whose lineup features Jim, alongside Jules Holland, Chris Tierney of The Living End, legendary vocalist Jimmy Barnes, and at the production helm, Kevin Shirley. This Straight to Video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo. Now, Affinity Photo is an incredible piece of photo editing software, which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. It's used to create the podcast's episode artwork with all that cool video cassette style, which you see each week. And it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market. So if you can, please head on over and show them some support at affinity.serif.com. All right, let's do this. For everything you need to know about Slim Jim Phantom, then after this chat, you can head on over to his website, slimjimphantom.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video talk with the rock and roll legend that is Slim Jim Phantom. Hello. How's it going, sir? Going great. How about you, buddy? Yeah, I'm good, mate. It's not quite as sunny here. It's been a right miserable day in the UK, but I'm sure you're familiar with that kind of conditions. Yeah, I was there for a month. I just got back. I mean, I guess the UK is something of a home from home after all these decades of touring since the 80s for you. Oh, yeah. I love going to England. I have a very special relationship there. Yeah, we kind of started there in a funny way. And, you know, I still think that they know more about American Roots music than than they do in, uh, you know, Manchester, UK knows more about it than Manchester, New Hampshire, for sure. And I don't know why. I could do a whole essay about post-war image of America and, you know, the positivity that they want from American imagery. There's a lot of stuff, but I just know that it is. And for 40 years, we've been going to England and always having a good time and always doing well there. And I I love going, to be honest with you. Was it 1980 when you first arrived? 1980, yeah, summertime. Was it just the three of you that made that initial trip? Yeah. yeah. What did you have planned when you arrived? Did you just feel you had to make that jump from New York and try and make a name for yourselves overseas? Yeah, we had just heard we would follow NME six months later, if you know, from an import record store kind of thing. And we really didn't know what to expect, to be honest with you. You know, we thought we'd walk off the plane and there would be, you know, Beatlemania or, you know, everyone was a teddy boy. We really didn't know. And then it was, well, you said it was a good idea. No, you said it was a good idea. How was that flight over? Was it your first time out of the US? Yeah, it was my first time on an airplane. Who did you fly with? Can you remember? Oh, no. No. <laughs> that. But I know they didn't want to let us in. You guys are in a band. No, we're not. Somehow Lee got away, I think, and said he was going to study music and he had a grandmother that lived there or whatever, and he got in. Brian and I, they we were not completely stupid. We tried to get in different lines, but you know, we were flying in complete regalia, you know, <laughs> pants and a drape jacket and, you know, high hair and blue suede shoes. You know, it was so someone walked through the immigration line and said, No, you two come together. Oh, I don't know him. Please. <laughs> Don't yeah. insult our intelligence and made us go through the line together. And we, of course, were lying and they let us in with like a two week visa or whatever. 
we somehow got in and never left really we just stayed till we made the record six months you know something and then we traveled to europe a few times and by that time we got the proper paperwork in order but initially we almost didn't get in lemmy was one of the first people who came out to see you guys perform well yes because we had original maybe 10 shows there after we'd been there for six months we knocked on doors went to parties and anything we can get into for free or hang around we became part of a little you know that pub scene in london the greyhound the golden lion the ding walls, the marquee club. And we finally knocked on enough doors that we were allowed to go on four o'clock in the afternoon and be the first of nine bands that day. But we had been hanging out so much that the original crowd that came to see us were really just maybe they'll go home, maybe they'll shut up, maybe they'll, you know, maybe they're good. Maybe. So it was that original crowd. Lemmy was one of them, Strummer, Chrissy Hine. It was like that original scene in London who would do those things, go out to see exciting new things. And we had met them all hanging around at parties and that. So they came to see us and then we were good at it. So it made a little stir. So the next time they did an interview, you know, Strummer is talking to Melody Maker. What do you do? Well, I went to see this band from New York. And the same with Strummer and Lamb. And Just a single line in a magazine or a newspaper could make a difference back then. People were really paying attention. The six or seven music mags every week, Melody Maker and NME and Sounds and Record Mirror and Time Out and all, they needed stuff really, you know. And everyone talked every week. You didn't change that much in two weeks. You know, what'd you do last week? Well, I went to see this band and there were a few people said the same thing. And so they would send their own journalists there then. And then it became a, you know, like a bit of a thing to do in London for a few months, you know, see these wacky guys from New York who stand on the drums. They don't smash them, they stand <laughs> on them, you know. I had Tarquin Gotch on this show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, okay. We spoke a lot about his relationship working with John Hughes later in his career, but early on he worked for Arista Records and was important in signing the Stray Cats. Oh yeah, he was there. He was one of the guys, man. And I reconnected with him a year or so ago here in LA. He was friends with some of the same people that are my neighbors. And I went to their home and, wait a minute, man, I've seen you in 30 years. And like, he looks the same. I look the same. We had the same, basically the same memory of everything. His is probably better because they were the adult and he was great. I love the guy. So that was that was a very cool thing. And I mean, everyone kind of from that original gang went on to do nice things, you know. That's fantastic. And you're chatting to me now from the West Coast of America, whereas you were born and raised on the East Coast. What is it about California that convinced you to relocate out there? Well, it's like TV, kind of, you know, convertibles and palm trees. It's all true. I grew up in New York and then I went to London and then we worked around Europe a lot. So I we had not come to the States. It wasn't until we were around for maybe two years that we came back to the States. And the first time we came to LA, I just... I'm staying. It really was everything they said. It was February and it was nice weather and they had palm trees and convertibles and I, I just stayed. What year was that? Do you remember? 82. I'm a big fan of the Hollywood hard rock scene of the late 80s and early 90s. And um, one thing of your career, which I'm incredibly interested in, I think more people, particularly over here, should know about, is that in the late 90s, you opened the Cat Club on the Sunset Strip. Yeah. I was lucky enough to visit a couple of times, but I unfortunately wasn't there on some of the wilder nights. I think Thursdays were the night to be there, right? Yeah, Thursdays. I, I opened this little bar on Sunset Boulevard. I lived around there and, you know, was friends with everyone. And we had a club before the Hollywood Boulevard, but I didn't really want to be in clubs anymore unless I could be on Sunset Boulevard where I could walk to and was my patch. And the right perfect storm happens and there's a liquor license. It could be attached to a building that was, you know, it's a whole boring thing, you know, but we did it. A couple of partners of mine. And we opened this little, what I wanted to be a snazzy cocktail lounge. And it quickly told me that it wanted to be a live music venue. So we booked every kind of music, comedy shows, folk nights, rock nights. I mean, every kind of thing. But Thursday nights, I would play. My inspiration was to pay the rent and pay the employees and pay the liquor bill, you know, and it just became a thing. I brought some equipment from my garage and we made a little stage out of plywood. I just started calling people to come play. And the first band there was myself, Bernard Fowler, who, you know, the Rolling Stones famously, the background singer, Stevie Salas, guitar ace. He played with Rod and a bunch of other people. Carmine Rojas, who played with Bowie, Rod as well. Like just my friends. That was the original band. We did like couches there. We moved the couches out of the way and we would play Thursday. Days. And then it became a full time live music venue. And then people just started dropping in. And one of the core bands was Gilby Clark, myself, Tracy Guns, Johnny Grappauer, who played with Slash's first solo band. 
So that was the core band. Teddy Zigzag from Guns N' Roses to uh, Dizzy Reed. Like a lot of hard rock luminaries would stop by. You know, really organic, to be honest with you. And it, then it became a thing to do. And so every now and again, I mean, Axl Rose would come and then... I guess you never knew who was going to stop by one night. And then it would just be us, you know? <laughs> so like sometimes people would look, hey, where's so-and-so? Well, he was here last week. You missed it. You're just going to have to settle for us tonight. But yes, it became a thing to do. And we, we had a, a very good quality of jam, rock and roll, band for i think we were open close to 20 years many important players that have influenced me were part of the great jam nights you had there and i've had a bunch of them on this show ryan roxy eric dover and i'm a big fan of stefan adik who has a great youtube show oh yes he's got the gift of gab he's a new york guy i stay in touch with everyone speak to everybody still all the time yeah was it your club that brought that core of musicians together did you know those guys before you opened the club that was like the third wave ryan who had played in slash's band as well and eric Eric Dover, who's one of my favorite musicians, my favorite people ever. Insane. <laughs> that guy. Knew him from Jellyfish, and then he had one of the best bands ever called Imperial Drag. They used to have residency in Viper Room. They were all part of Alice Cooper's band. Teddy as well. I don't remember how they started coming. And then Stefan was a friend of Ryan's. Came out from New York together. That gang, we did it for a few years. That was like a solid lineup for quite a while. A lot of people would stop by and play then. Did you guys all go out and play outside of LA as well? I think I've heard you mention something about that, doing some more shows. For a while, we would get someone who wanted, someone who had a club elsewhere in the States who was visiting LA and would come to Cat Club and saw that. So yeah, we used to go to like, say, Chicago or Milwaukee or Phoenix, any place was a bar owner that had come to LA and they wanted to do it, you know. Did you say that made you a better drummer at the time? Well, for sure, because it would be four hours every Thursday, you, got, you know, some good practice. Probably playing something you've never played before as well. Yes, like a lot of, I had to come to what they knew more than they had to come to what I knew, but it was my place. You know, I'm the one that had to approve the bar tab and, you know, pay the parking every night for them. So yeah, it did really just like playing so much, you know, having to learn a hundred songs I didn't know before. So um, <laughs> it was good. You did get to perform with Lemmy at the Cat Club though, with the band Head Cat. That's like an amazing example of the power and journey that music takes you on. You and Lemmy to meet in London in the early 80s and all that time later, you had a band together performing at your own club all the way out in Hollywood. It's incredible. Yeah, he moved to LA in the 90s and I was saying touch with him when I went to England all the time and he came up and played with Stray Cats, I think a few times, you know, Hammersmith. Smith Odeon and those kind of things. And I was in the audience of the No Sleep Till Hammersmith gig, <laughs> 1980, I think. So, and then Lem moved to LA organically because he wanted to be a Sunset Boulevard. He moved right behind where I lived. So he was my neighbor as well as my buddy. So he lived very geographically close. We were close personally. So an opportunity came up to do a track for an Elvis Presley tribute record. And who do I know that loves Elvis Presley? Lem, Danny Harvey, who's just a pal of mine over the years. He's very skilled at, you know, studio kind of things. So I called Lem and Harvey to go and play this track. Of course, we did it in 10 minutes, but we had five hours in the studio book. So then we, well, let's try this one. Let's try that one. And we, before we knew it, we came back every day for a few weeks. The studio available tomorrow. Yeah, okay. So we made a record by accident and Lem really loved it. His whole thing was rock and roll and rock Billy, Little Richard and Buddy Holly were his favorites. And he saw it as a bucket list thing to kind of record these songs and to, you know, and I'm, you know, happy to make that happen for him, you know. So then that developed into playing some gigs and we, we had the cat club at our disposal. So we did, I think, a New Year's Eve show first, and then it, we kept doing shows in between their schedule. He didn't like being off, but they had a wacky schedule. So when he was home, usually February, March into a little bit of April, we would go and play every year. So it was kind of cool. I know you're familiar with the Waterloo bar in Blackpool. I mean, they've got a whole Lemmy set up there with the bar. And I think they've got, yeah. got his bass rig there as well now, I think, behind a cage. Yeah, they got everything there. I think they're franchised in Lemmy's Bar and Grill or whatever. they Lemmy's Lounge. So they have one at the Rainbow here. And I think they Waterloo, which is a good place. I played there a couple of times now. And I'll be back there again this summer. You know, it's kind of cool being a little bit older in a funny way. It's the, you know, everyone's connected and, you know, like it doesn't take too long to make maybe two steps and you with really anyone in rock and roll at this point. And everybody's nice to me, you know, so it's kind of nice now, you know. Everyone wants you to be you at this point. Do what you know how to do. Exactly, man. And you continue to collaborate to this day and you're set to release a new album from the Barnstormers. The lead single, Johnny's Gone, sounds amazing. Thanks, obviously, to everyone involved, but you also have producer Kevin Shirley sharing lead billing with you all. What can you tell us about this 
Another new project. <laughs> well, it's kind of part of what I just said. With, you know, being older, I met Jimmy Barnes in 1981. We went to Australia early a few times, and he was again like an ambassador of their place. Like Lemmy used to go to all the gigs in London. Barnes, he would come to all the gigs in Sydney, and we were just friends right away. And I had met him at Jules right after that back in England because the Stray Cats and Squeeze played a bunch of shows together. And just from being around again, kind of everybody knew each other, especially in London. And we had always talked about it. Barnes. And I, I talked about it for 40 years. Someday we're going to make a record with Johnny Burnett song. And we talked about it, talked about it. And just last year, he came to me with the idea two years last year about doing it. And he said, I want to get Jules. And I said, you know, Jules. And like, I should know better because everybody knows everybody. I didn't know those two knew each other. Seven degrees of Slim Jim Phantom. Is that how it works? It's like one degree sometimes. <laughs> and like, of course they would know each other. Jules would have gone to Australia. Barnes, you would have saw him there. He probably did later or the tube or of course. So that was another little connection. Chris Cheney, I've known since he was a kid. He came to see the Stray Cats as a young boy with his sister who was old enough to get him into the show and affected his life but he formed you know living end and now he's of age too so and i worked with him on a bunch of things so we were going to go to australia to do the recording with shirley at his place my wife plays eagles of death metal they were supposed to tour so it's going to be a nice australian work slash you know holiday and everything got changed we didn't go but rather than give up on it kevin shirley's the star of the show i think he said let's make it anyway and i'm an analog guy i don't know what he's talking about so there's a way to do this so he would send me a basic click track over the top of a little arrangement he would knock together of the songs we wanted to do and i would record them here at Gilby Clark's house, another good rock name, drop name. And I would send them back to Shirley. He would put the drums in it and then send that to Jules. Jules would record the piano, send that back to Shirley. Shirley would add the drums and the piano, send that to Chris, who, and round we go. And he was the hub and we were the spokes, you know. He really made it happen. And over the course of a year, we made this record. And we would do like Zoom calls every few weeks. Everyone would gang in together and talk about what we wanted to do. And it would have been so easy to give up. And the interview would be, well, we really wanted to do this, you know, and we're all pals and someday, but because of Shirley and everyone wanting to do it, I made it happen. And that comes out soon. Johnny's Gone is in the charts in Australia and it's, the record will come out, I think in May, the album. And, you know, hopefully we'll go there and play. And you finally all get in one room together and play. <laughs> that would be like, yeah. <laughs> So that we do a record without that. And now that's going to happen. Yeah. So I think it's just a matter of time. Hopefully I speak to Jules all the time. While I was just in England, I stayed in touch with him a little bit. We stay in touch with Barnsley and Chris email and every now and again, we'll do a Zoom call. And so it's all happening. Modern technology for the most old fashioned guys. You know, it's good. There you go. Is there anyone who you've got to know well over the years, but not had the chance to work with due to scheduling, but you always speak about it when you meet, like, we will do it one day. Well, most of those have been done. I mean, I'm doing this documentary about rockabilly music. You know, there's going to be a whole new slew of people that we talk with them about doing it someday. And we got to get busy now. You'll be back in the UK in June. Yes. June and July, we're doing with my trio, the Let's Rock Festivals, which are going to be great. And then uh, that's like every Saturday for like eight weeks or something. So I'm going to play all those. And then during the week, do a few smaller shows and keep it all going. Excellent. I think you're going to be at the Hairy Dog in Derby, so I'll see you there. That's a great one, yeah. He's a good guy. We'll speak to him on email as well. Fantastic. Jim, I'll let you go because I know you're super busy, but thank you ever so much for chatting with me. I look forward to seeing you in the UK very, very soon. Thanks so much. You want to come to the shows like that? Just get in touch with me. Thanks so much to Slim Jim Phantom for chatting right here on the Straight to Video podcast. I look forward to the new LP from the Barnstormers, which drops on the 26th of May. And watch out for the Slim Jim Phantom trio to return to the UK very soon. All the information on releases and live dates can be found at slimjimphantom.com or on Jim's social media pages. Now, this year marks 10 years since the release of the debut EP from Straight to Video. Some of you may or may not know, but Straight to Video began life as a music project where I did cover versions of my favorite movie soundtrack songs with the help of some of my uber talented musician friends. The CD features five songs and has guest appearances from Jarrett Reddick of Bowling for Soup, 
Tori Stoffrigan from Enough's Enough, and also Johnny Monaco from Stephen Pierce's band, to name but a few. I've just released the EP as a limited run of CDs, so if you missed it the first time, then you can grab that all-important physical copy from stvpod.com. So that's it for today's show. It's been a short but sweet one, but thanks for listening. And remember to always be kind. Please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon. Music